Welcome to the Send More Offers Real Estate Show with Brandon Barnes, showing you how to do wholesaling deals consistently without having to go on seller appointments. Learn the key tips and strategies that Brandon's students use to find deeply discounted properties that are pennies on the dollar, all while avoiding wear and tear on their vehicle, body, and freedom. Whether you're looking for your first deal or your next deal, it's time to send more offers with your host, Brandon Barnes. Hey, hey, Zeus, welcome to the show. Happy to have you here. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'd love to share some some stories with you. Yeah, I'm super excited um, because I know that you guys are one of the um, great data providers that you know, help folks find the best deals in your market. And you're doing some interesting stuff with machine learning, AI. Uh, so I want to just jump right into that. You know, what's so important about being kind of in this first wave of, you know, machine learning and, and, and data analytics that is going to help pave the way for investors like myself to do more deals. Yes, well, that, that's, that's a great way to open this because machine learning AI is all trending right now, right? ChatGPT did a really good job at making it accessible to the public uh, until, I don't know, a year and a half ago, a year ago. Machine learning was only for engineers with very specific software and hardware to be able to access and program over it. So we've been working with machine learning, in particular analytics, for maybe three, four years now. Uh, but it, it became very popular now. So it makes it easier to explain what we do. Well, in a nutshell, what we do is we look at historical data and identify what properties were sold to an investors and we reverse engineer, right? And we're trying to predict who is more likely to sell a discount? And, and one of the important things that not a lot of investors put attention to this is data is a really important part of our businesses on the lead gen side, right? So let's separate our business in lead generation, sales, and then we have the operation to get the deals closed. Just focus on the lead gen. Data is a really important part of it. Uh, however, how often and how intentional you are on how you engage with those sellers it's even more important, right? Because what happens is when we are able to predict who's more likely to sell the discount, only a very small percentage of the properties are highly likely to sell the discount. Right. The rest, they have a significantly better than average. And the other ones, there's a big pool of sellers. They're better than average, but it's not a um, hundred times better than an average property, if that makes sense. So what we need to do is combine data with outbound marketing plan to be able to maximize the return of investment. And that's one of the things that we're very passionate about. We are constantly predicting who's likely to sell a discount and trying to see when, so we can try to engage as often as needed uh, without overspending on each specific seller. Does love that make it. sense? Yeah, no, that's great. I love it. and. You know, for most folks starting out, so I was just speaking to somebody who was just getting going and I told her that, you know, hey, in addition to using your favorite software company, uh, which we suggest PropStream or Batch Leads to pull like the big groups of Aftency owners and equity, high equity folks. In addition to that, going down to the county and getting good data um, at the county level. So your niche list, your evictions, your tax yeah. delinquent, your probate, getting those on the regular so that you can have kind of a leg up. How is it, uh, you know, how do you guys work with folks? Like where, where does your data fit into the mix? You know, do you suggest, Hey, starting with, you know, one of our lists or, you know, using this AI tool to kind of trim down your big world, you know, absentee owner list? Like, where does your data play into that for, for somebody just trying to get going? Well, that, that's a great, great, great question. So we typically work with investors that are doing 40 deals a year or, or more. We work with some of the highest investors in the country, the best investors in the country, um, highest volume, what I meant, right? And there's that separation. Like, we'd like to think we are if you have a fire going already, your business is running, you have acquisition teams, you have a marketing team, you have that, we're the gasoline that you pour into your fire. So we're going to optimize everything that you're already doing, right? So nice. that's our target audience. That's how who we help the best. 
Uh, and you gave some great tips for somebody who is just starting. And actually, I'm, I'm going to share it. Um, you, can, you can put it on the link in the show notes or just write me at my email. I'll have my assistant send you guys. We have a simplified version of what we do, right? They can, anybody who is getting exactly the list that you talked about, tag the link or an absentee and create a specific guideline. Because well, what you want to do if you're just starting out, you want to segment your list and create a 30, 60, and 90-day plan so you reach out to those folks without overspending, right? Because you agree with me, Brandon. You have a ton of experience in this. A pre foreclosure owner does not have the same needs as a high equity owner, mm-hmm. right? Uh, just giving a very simple example, but it's, it's so true because a pre foreclosure owner, they have to sell or something else is going to happen to their life. If they, if they don't sell, they're either going to lose the house or, or they have to pay the mortgage. If they don't have money, they have to sell, right? A high equity owner, maybe something is going on in there. And obviously, it's a good opportunity for us as investors. However, the timing of those sellers is completely different. What we encourage our users to do is take that data. We, are, we, we segment the data in a 30, 60, 90-day uh, brackets so they can create a marketing plan and go after them. So the properties are extremely likely to sell a discount. We put them in a 30-day, so they get a postcard every month. They get very aggressive cold calling and two times a month text messaging. But the people who are in the 90-day sequence, they get a, a postcard every 90 days, a call every 90 days, and a text every 90 days because they don't need that many touch points in order to convert, not in this part of their journey, if that makes sense. Wow. Awesome. And just for people that, you know, say maybe they're not using your data, but I, I definitely uh, yeah. want to encourage folks to check the show notes and um, get the freebie um, that Jesus is offering um, to create your own marketing plan. But give folks the parameters of like why um, they fall into those buckets. Is it just that the folks that are having the bleeding need, like they just filed eviction, they're just going through pre-foreclosures. Those are the folks that are on the 30 day of the regular touches. And then the 90 day is more so just absentee owner. Is that kind of how you break it up? Yeah, so th- there's more layers to that. I mean, uh, this is a simplified version, right? Like we we use some advanced, we use millions of data points to try to predict further. We obviously take all these niche lists as a part of our data points, and they have a, an important component of our modeling is based on the stress or motivation, right? Um, what happens is if if somebody needs to sell versus they might want to sell, they want to or the house might be in a bad condition, there's different needs. So your messaging is different, right? Your urgency on how often you engage with them is different too. So that's kind of what the approach. Imagine if you had a, a, a lead calling you and say, hey man, my mom just passed away. I can't deal with the house. I live out of state. I need to sell in a month. I don't want to move there. I don't want to do anything. And somebody else call and another seller calls you on a lead, right? And calls you and say, Hey man, just tell me offer. Just, just want to know how much you're gonna offer. Who are you gonna follow up with more often? Right. The first well, actually the first one. All right. Right? The second one, you're probably gonna lose it, put it as a cold lead in your system. We try to take the same approach on the prospect level. If we have the data, so that's why data is so important, because once you have the data, you can make decisions on that level. Love it. Love it. Um, and so what do you think is working really well right now? Like, have you seen any changes um, in the market or is it the same thing that was working a few years ago is is working well for your clients now? They're still kind of processing leads the same way. What, what are you seeing right now? What I'm seeing is the segmentation, what we call tactics. Like for us, we break down lead generation in three aspects. One is the data, right, which we can provide and we have a guide. We'll share the guide that we have for you to break down your data if you're earlier uh, before you can join us. Then the second part is the strategy, right? How often you engage with them. And the third one is tactics. Uh, so tactic is segmenting the sellers. And this is something that we're seeing and is trending. We're working on a project that we've been working for a couple, well, several months now, honestly, is applying and elevating direct mail to a whole new level, right? Because mm. what we talked about, like an absentee owner needs to hear and receive a, a letter, a postcard, whatever it is, 
completely different than an owner-occupied or a senior owner or a probate owner. So we want to apply all the data points into direct mail. And what we're seeing is that trend. We're seeing that the very sophisticated investors, the ones that have the ability, they are taking direct mail to a next level and they're leveraging the data to be able to apply it in there. Mm. I'll give you an example. The check ladder is really hot right now. That's like a specific one that everybody is using. But if you pair that check ladder with some bullet points of solutions that you provide based on the needs of the seller, your response rates increases as well. Oh, right? So it's I taking like a concept and doing a double click, right? Going a little bit deeper and more targeted to get even better results. Got it. And just for folks that uh, may have not seen this before, when you say like the check letter, you mean uh, like it's a it's a direct mail piece that looks like somebody's receiving a check in the mail from like the government or or something, right? And that just gets them opening. It, it, yes. Uh, the the whole purpose of direct mail, the first either is a postcard or mail is to them to spend us an extra second reading what is about, right? We all get a, a bunch of junk. So the check stands out right away. So they are curious to open it. If you get them to open, you have a higher chance of them reading it. There's a number in there. So there's the premise. The same when you're crafting your, your postcard, your purpose is not just then sell the house to you on that postcard. It's just to give you a call, right? So breaking down the marketing into micro pieces, right? And, and, and just, okay, first purpose of postcards, stand out through the crowd, then have them give me a call. That's all I want. On a check letter, you want them to open. And the letter has that effect, like a check, all, but you're never going to throw a check away. You're always going to be a little bit curious. What is right. this? <laughs> right. All right. Exactly. I love it. Um, you know, there's people that, that are out there saying right now, I just thought, I think I saw an email from Chris Chico, who's like one of the OGs and, um, in this game. And, uh, he sent out an email, it's probably clickbait, but, um, mentioning that cold calling and text messaging is dead, right? Because of the federal regulations. I don't wholeheartedly believe that. I think it's, you know, more so, um, you know, there are more hoops to jump through and, you know, registering your phone numbers so they don't come up spam and, and, you know, registering your company so that uh, you can, you are approved to uh, do outreach. But where do you stand on that fence? Um, you know, would you also agree with them and say, hey, cold calling and text messaging is dead. You should only be focusing on you know, online and, and direct mail. What are you saying uh, as far as that goes? So first off, I live 20 minutes away from Kishiko. He's a buddy. <laughs> I love him. Uh, I love his content. If anybody's interested in Facebook ads, he's the guy. Go talk to him. He's the 1, grandfather 000%. of wholesaling and, and virtual wholesaling. He knows this shit. 1,000%. Having said that, co-calling and SMS are still alive. Do I believe it has many, many years ahead of them? Maybe. Not a, as we know it today, right? Like back in the day when we started texting was 2017, mm -hmm. we would get 35% response rate. Like every thousand messages or less, we would get a contract. Now it's not the same, right? Like now you're fighting with the carriers. Uh, the carriers eventually, the carriers don't want you to send an unwanted message. So... But there is some incentives in there because there's a lot of money in those messages shoot, right? Don't right. get me wrong. However, I think they're going to block it eventually. So my take on this is, one, consult with the TCPA attorney. Make sure, because each state has its own regulation, make sure that you are okay with the risks. On every state, there's going to be risks. Just make sure that you're okay with the risk and you know what the consequences are and make an educated decision and ride the wave as long as you can. That's it. Cold calling, texting are great marketing channels. The, the, the disadvantage of texting and cold calling is it requires you to either train your VAs a lot to get you a decent lead because if not, you're going to be overwhelmed, right? Like to give some benchmarks, if you do PPC, you got to get a deal out of 15 leads or so from a web form, right? If you're doing cold calling and texting, if you're not doing it right, you can be 150 leads per contract. I think the national average is around 100, right? So 
Think about that's 149 no's to get one yes. Right. And people that you have to follow up and, and put it in your funnel. So um, a lot of special beginners, and I, I encourage them because it's a great way to get your, your, your feet wet and, and try and have conversations. However, it is very time consuming. It requires a lot of good processes. You should do it right and at, at scale. Yeah. So I, I'm a firm believer that you should do as many marketing channels. So let me premise this. If you're in a, a seasoned investor, you should do as many marketing channels as possible because marketing channels goes up and down. Right. You need to be consistent with that. Once one goes up, the other one goes down. Like direct mail right now, it's going up because there's more challenges on cold calling and texting. So direct mail is picking up response again. So it, it's seasons of direct mail uh, on any marketing channel. For a not so seasoned investor, somebody's trying to get into the game, I would say get one marketing channel at a time. Right. Yeah. So it's a different advice based on where you are in your journey. Yeah, I love it. Um, it just to give people um, some advice, when you say doing text messaging or cold calling right, what do you mean? And I'll, I'll preface that with, you know, some of the things that I talk about, and it might be helpful for you to, to speak more about the SMS, but with cold calling, right? The intro is everything, you know, aside from all the regulations and making sure your call gets through without spam likely popping up. You know, the intro is everything, you know, not focusing on conditions so much, really, you know, making sure that you're sticking your intro, asking your question and then getting to the details and then passing it along to the next person. Right. You know, making sure that your call sound good, sounds like an American, sounds local. Right. I, those are some of the tips that I, I provide for, you know, doing cold calling. Right. What about text messaging? What advice do you have for folks? Uh, on how to do text messaging right so that it can still be effective. Well, so I'm, I'll give you, I don't know if you knew this, Brandon, but we, before, until December 2021, we, on top of the data service that we offer, we had a taxing platform. It was a white glove taxing service. Right. We would do it for our clients, right? So at one point we had 150 remote employees. It was like a work from home center. It was direct hire from us. And we sent in a three and a half year spam over 2 billion of tax and cold calls. Wow. Uh, so we have a little bit of experience here. I don't <laughs> know it all because you never know it all. Uh, however, I, I, I can very confidently say that crafting the message, focusing on the benefit that you offer the seller is better than, hey, I want to buy your house for, for cash, right? Um, an example of that is... Hey, we help with these type of situations, right? So really taking the time and um, lo most of the texting platforms now have a lot of restrictions on the type of messages that you can send because of the trigger words to go to spam. So work within those guidelines, but try to focus on a solution-oriented text versus I want to buy a house. Um, right. And the frequency is everything there. The frequency is everything and I know is not yet, is not a no forever, right? So that's, a, that's the number one thing that I, 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 I recommend our clients because they come to us and act as buy for texting is texting will generate a lot of responses. A lot are going to be cold answers and are not really interested, but that's a big win. If on the first initial message, you can, on the first few interactions, you can confirm the owner, it's the biggest win you can have. Because yeah. now... When you skip trace, you know this, you skip trace a property, you get seven, sometimes even 12 numbers back, right? right. Imagine how then inefficient that is. I have 10 numbers that can possibly be the, the, the right number of this owner. If I get one to confirm that the owner, now it's a one-to-one -one relationship. I made my entire system 10 times more effective. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when, when you get a yes, on the ownership confirmation, then it's a follow-up game. If they're not interested now, hey, just put them on a follow-up sequence, nurture them. It's just going to take more time. If they say yes on top of saying I'm the owner, that's a bigger win, right? Like that's a home run. Let's take it. Uh, but that's kind of what the approaches that I would say is solution-oriented, focus on validating the ownership because that way you have one number per property that you're going after, especially if you're putting a lot of effort in building your data. You want to make sure that you have one number per property instead of 10 numbers per property. And then every no is not a not yet. 
It's not a no forever. Put them on a follow-up sequence to start following up with them 15, 30 days later and re-engage them differently, right? Like now you know they're the owner. They already told you they're not interested at that time. Follow up with them a little bit different. It's a different type of conversation now. It's not necessarily a lead. Uh, we call them not yet interested in our, in our, in our uh, CRM. It, it's it's an intermediate between a prospect and a lead, but you want to continue engaging with them. Love it. You mentioned briefly, you said uh, frequency is important. What did you mean? Is it, was that just a, about the follow-up process after the initial message or were you talking about something different? So two things, right? So if they haven't responded is how often you send them a new message, right? And, and trying to get them to respond. If they have responded is also a fact, like depending on where they are in their data breakdowns that you can, you can segment it and follow up with them a little bit different. Like, Again, a pre-foreclosure response to you is, hey, I'm not interested. Get out of my way. I'm the owner. I'm calling that lead tomorrow. <laughs> but a high equity owner responds, I'm the owner. I'm not interested. I'm sending him a text in 30, maybe 45 days from now. Mm. There's the difference, right? So having the data to allow you to make those decisions is so important. Love it. Good stuff. Um, just to uh, briefly, um, you know, kind of round this out, then what CRM do you suggest? What are you guys using? And, and is it helpful in this kind of prospecting? Because, you know, there's so many prospects you got to go through. You know, how, how are you weeding them out? Do you have your, you know, automated drip sequencing and then they go over to a different funnel? Like, how are you guys managing all this data, let's say, for an individual investor? So an individual investor, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, a lot of challenges in there. There's no single platform that can solve it. If you're an advanced investor, um, I'm quick to disclose, I'm an investor in 8020 CRM. It's a Salesforce solution that was built exactly for this, to be able to host all your data from prospect all the way to closing a contract in one place, all the way to having a, your own disposition portal and all of that. Um, if you are early, try to use the tools. I, we we're, we're, we recommend launch control. We'll be talking about texting. Launch control. launch control is probably the best one that out there today. Um, Leverage all the tools that they have. They have a lot of these nurture follow-ups. I forgot how they call it in their system, but they have a lot of tools that allows you to keep the prospects in check in the right buckets and the right follow-up frequencies. And only once they become a lead, that they're confirmed and that they're asking uh, for an offer, or you've got a little bit of validation that they are, we should treat your CRM and keep following up with them there forever. I believe... That is very difficult to keep prospects and leads in one system unless you are you are able to afford Salesforce. Unfortunately, Salesforce is the Ferrari of the CRMs and it's very expensive. So for beginners, it might not be the best solution. But if you have an advanced a business and you want to elevate and have everything consolidated, all your data, imagine having all the properties in your county inside your CRM. The moment the lead comes in, you already have everything in there, right? And being able to apply all these frequencies, the, the, the cadences for marketing, from marketing to nurturing to the not people that are not interested, you can have it all in one place uh, with the CRM that we built. Good stuff. I love it. And there will be links in the show notes uh, for that. Um, and even if, you know, on my website, there is a uh, affiliate link for a uh, discount on your launch control. Um, also, man, look, off. I'm sure, look, we have this segment, it's called Deal Diaries, and we like to break down, you know, some of the most interesting deals, craziest stories, biggest deals. Um, do you have a deal that comes to mind that you can share with us so that folks get a, a sample, a taste of what this business can be like? I'll share one of our biggest lessons and, and one of our biggest deals. It was our second off-market deal because when I started back in 2017, the MLS was really hot. So our first three deals we did off the MLS, that's a whole not the story. <laughs> but we were very fortunate. We got three deals right away. And then we realized really quickly the MLS spreads were really thin, like $3,000, $5,000. It was thin for our market here in Miami. It was, it was small margins. So we started doing off-market. 
And with my background, we didn't have our data service at the moment, right? So we went, what you said at the beginning of the show, we went to Condor Records. So I didn't want to have the same data everybody else was getting because that would mean that I would get, at most, the results everybody else was getting, right? Right. And we wanted to separate it. So I come from a data background. I'm in like, I study electric engineer. So we downloaded the entire data set from the county. We, we started pulling tags of Lincoln directly from the county, everything directly from the county, right? And building our own system. At that moment, it was all a bunch of Excel sheets. Uh, and all of a sudden, we started cold calling. That was our first marketing channel. We started cold calling. Seller answered the phone and said, I have no idea. Do I still own that house? I thought I lost it. <laughs> okay, great. We have, again, first, probably first week doing off market uh, marketing, we had no idea what we we're doing. We're <laughs> just figuring out. The, the, the thing that I think was the biggest lesson is that I didn't realize until maybe six months later is the seller told us multiple times, you're the only ones that ever call me about this property. And we were, what? Like this property was on a divorce list, tax delinquent list, proof of foreclosure. Like they lost, like he thought he lost his house in foreclosure. Oh. The bank couldn't foreclose on the property. So he moved away. The, the house was abandoned. There, there was a, bunch, a nightmare in there. Right? But what's surprising to me that nobody else was talking to that seller. Right. And the, the part, this is when it ties the ball on how important data is and having the right data that six months later, we started doing like a deal review and try to understand how we got it. And we always remember of this deal. We did, I think it was $85,000 on our second off market deal. It was like, mm. oh my God, this is so easy. It's <laughs> not, by the way, guys, anybody trying this, we got very fortunate. Uh, <laughs> uh, but what we learned is that property wasn't on everybody's list because it had a bunch of unknown filters. What I mean by this is, on county records, it had no bedrooms, it had no year built, and it didn't have the last sale date. So when a, a regular investor goes in and try to buy a list, those are typical filters that you do, right? right. You don't want properties that sold in the last 15 years or 10 years. You don't want properties built recently. But by applying those filters on any of the data tools that you have out there, you're going to miss on all these unknown. And what we learned now that we have a data company, we own the data for the entire country. We know 20 to 40%, depending on the market that you are, is unknown. What I mean by that is, if you buy data from a regular list source, all the other data vendors that you buy a subscription and you can download data, you are most likely missing on 20 to 40% of the data set. And there is still some properties that we call hidden gems because they could be on everybody's list, but there are nobody's list. So you have virtually no competition. And that's the only reason why I think we closed that deal. We had so many issues in the, in the transaction of that. Like I remember my partner last minute, the seller was at the closing table. We had a buyer. So we didn't, we were double closing on the deal. The buyer was kind of a delaying the wire. So we had the seller waiting and the closing. He was really upset and he said, I'm only closing with you guys because you're the only ones who ever contacted me. <laughs> like until the last day, he made us know they were the only ones. And that's the only reason why he closed with us. <laughs> that is funny. That is wild. Yes. And so this particular house, you know, once you got it and you sent it out, you already had, you know, amazing spread. Did you know how much it was worth? Like, how were you able to get such a great margin on that particular deal? So we had a lot of things that we had to pay. I, I think the seller netted like $10,000. The property was worth, I think we sold it for like 130, but there were some back taxes. There were some, some, some other things that we had to pay off of that. So we only made like the, the spread wasn't a hundred and something was like 80, 84, 85, something along those lines. Uh, we, we didn't know also the, the price point. Like I think we, we, we offered that 99,000. And actually in Miami, there is a lot of co-wholesalers. So a co-wholesaler marked it up that 115 and we got an offer over asking price. Oh, and that's why we sold for 120 something. Oh, uh, that's <laughs> yeah. amazing. That, yeah. Figuring out prices is a science as well, right? Like, yeah, uh, it, it is, it is tricky. And over the years we have merged to, we try to price it higher than we think it is and say, send your best. Highest and best, and we sell for highest and best. No, good stuff. Um, last thing, uh, real quick is just with that unknown um, territory. 
Um, you know, I know that there are selections like in prop stream that you can select, you know, some, you know, unknown equity and unknown stuff. Um, is, is that, are you guys still, you know, pulling or providing an unknown list um, based on the pre-selections from the list companies, or are you just gathering every property in the county and seeing what's not, you know, uh, discussed or what's not listed um, in some of these other um, software services? So that's a great question. So I believe PropSim has some unknowns, but a lot of them are not. I like try to buy unknown last sale date. Try to buy unknown bedrooms. You won't find a filter for unknown bedrooms, right? Because it's a blank or a zero. So, and another thing to note is real estate is not digital yet. So every real estate transaction goes through somebody manually typing mortgage information. Uh, and I gave you these examples, but there are hundreds of data points that could be unknown that we, we use to build the list. So we do what we call a microscopic human review. So our, we have hundreds of columns on properties. There's over 700 columns from demographics, from properties, mortgages, all the information. I think it's thousands of, of columns. So all the ones that are really important that we use in our models. We do a microscopic human review, right? So we're, we go literally and see all the possible parameters and standardize it and fix it. You will be surprised how many properties have an E on bedroom count instead of a three. <laughs> wow. Some vendors figured out and solve it, but the, in the raw data, you will find a need on bedroom sometimes, right? Uh -huh. Or the year built, instead of being four digits, it's a year, a month, and a day. And that gets out of the data parameters, right? So we do a lot. Like, I think that's one of our um, magics or our, our really proprietary things is we take our time to process data and try to standardize as much as we can and identify all the unknowns as possible. So in our service, we deliver a, a, a monthly list per marketing channel, right? So you get one list for your direct mail, one list for cold call, one list for SMS. They are different between each other. They're always different from one month to the other. And we segment the ones that are hidden gems in there. So you know that you have virtually no competition or less competition most likely love it in some markets zero competition we we'll still see that good stuff we have folks uh you guys will definitely be able to check out the show notes to you know connect and, and find more um you know opportunities to work with pezos and his team um for great data just like this look i can't let you go without putting you through the lightning round are you ready for that i'll, I'll try all right let's do it Cool. So look, I have a series of rapid fire questions for you. You don't know the question. I don't know your answer. So just say the very first thing that comes to your mind. Um, what's one book that's been instrumental to your growth as a real estate investor? I'll say the most recent one, obviously, Rich Dad Poor Dad got me into real estate. But the most important one today is one that is not very popular. It's called the core value equation. So it's about building your business and be core value driven. Uh, on every decision that you make. It's an amazing, phenomenal book. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, if you could have drinks or coffee with any one person, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> it would be outside of business. It would be Ayrton Senna, uh, the Formula One driver. He was my hero growing up. I always watched the Formula One and I look up to him and I, I didn't get a chance to see him as, as I grew older. Yeah, say his name one more time. Ayrton Senna, I don't know how to say that. No, okay. <laughs> uh, he's a Brazilian. He was the GOAT of the okay. one awesome. back in the 90s, awesome. 80 in the 90s. Love it. Uh, what's your best advice for someone looking to do their very first deal? Know your market better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes from understanding where the foreclosures are filed, where the probates are filed, and learn how to talk to those people. Learn how the foreclosure process is in your market, right? Learn how the tax delinquent or the tax deed process is in your market and know that better than anybody else. So when you have a conversation with a seller, you can solve the problem. Love it. Um, what is one mistake on a deal specifically or a business in general that if you could do over, you would take that do over? So I'll do one in a deal. We went outside of our buy box, right? So we were doing 
residential single family house uh, wholesaling. And we came across uh, something that was commercial. We thought we knew it all. And just the fact it was out by, outside of our buy box, we spent probably hundreds of hours on that view and we lost 25 grand. Nice. Uh, so that's the lesson that I think it is. Stick to your buy box. There's a reason why hedge funds are so successful. It's because they have a buy box, they have a criteria, they don't deviate from it, and they know exactly what to do every time a property comes across their desk, right? Mm -hmm. It's a yes or no based on the decisions. Um, and, and that's an important process of our onboarding and, and our data. We help you, our clients, we help our clients have a buy box, and we don't put any properties that are not in the buy box in the prospecting list because that can generate a distraction and that distraction is more expensive than the money that you lose. That's a really big gem guys. And uh, even for me, when things started to shift in the market and like post COVID time, like we stopped looking at anything, you know, smaller than a thousand square feet. We started looking for things that only hedge funds would want so that if nothing else, you know, they would be a buyer. And if you kind of stick to that, then you're also in good shape with the most of the rest of the individual companies and buyers. So that's a great, great gem. Well, and, and to let, let me add something real quick to that. Like you, you nailed it because not only that, you cannot, like people don't, don't put numbers for the amount of dollars they spend on profits. They don't want to buy. They don't have a buyer for it. They don't want to flip it. Right. So. Having a strong buy box from the beginning, not only will save you time on your marketing, that's a lot, by the way. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars that you can save by having a strong, but also it will save time from your team, time from you to problem solve. Like best advice I can give is overall, regardless of where you are in your career, have a strong buy box and don't deviate from it. Love it. Really, really good stuff. Um, what is uh, the financial goal for your real estate investing company for this calendar year. And I know that's not your primary business. So uh, if you guys are just still doing deals, like what does that look like? How many, what are you trying to do for the year? We do roughly 70 to 80 deals a year. This year has been a little slower for us. My primary focus is on 80, 20 OEI, but we have a three year vision. Uh, we, we keep our wholesale business mainly to continue building wealth and keeping some deals that we see that we know they're will super appreciate or buy really deep. Um, our goal is to 10x in the next three years. No, I, mean, I, I just went through the Vivid Vision. There's a Vivid Vision book. That's another book that I would highly recommend. And we went through that and we have a three-year plan and this is what we're going to do. And we're going to 10x our rentals. We're going to 10x our 80-20 REI business. And, and that's what we are. Good stuff. If you woke up tomorrow with $500 million deposited into your account overnight, what's the first thing that you would go out and spend uh, with that newfound money? I would travel the world for a year. Uh, take the family, take the kids, take everybody I know. <laughs> I'd travel the world for a year. Love it, love it. Last one. What would you tell the person uh, that's listening right now that's looking to scale or grow their business and just, you know, just trying to do more than, you know, uh, one deal, you know, here or there? Yeah, focus. Uh, keeping your focus and focus on your buy box, focus on the things that you do. Um, one advice that I, I, I learned this maybe three, four years ago is the biggest and best investors in the country, they run a sales organization first. Mm. We think we're in the marketing and sales business, but if you really focus on sales, you can figure out ways to take care of marketing, right? You have vendors like us, you have PP, PPL, PPC vendors, leads. Today, you can have dozens of opinion uh, options to get leads. But if you focus on sales, that's how you're going to grow your business. I love it, man. That's amazing advice. Um, last thing, this is a bonus question for you. You know, what list would you tell someone that's looking to really crush it right now? What list would you tell them to go after? Depends on where you are. But uh, in general, say in the south, um, pre foreclosure. Thing. Yeah, pre foreclosure is is by far the best list that you. It, you just need to be very intentional and understand the pain that that seller is going through. Right. If you're a very solution oriented, a pre foreclosure list is. If you want a simpler one, the absentee list always performs well. Right. Um, that is on an individual level. If you're pulling less individually, those the two that I would say. With a two plus year tax delinquent, if you can get a hold of, is also pretty good. Would you suggest that folks go down to the county for uh, the pre foreclosure? Figure it out. 
like the earlier you get it. So my mo- motto on before closure is if you're not first, you're last. Yeah. You need to be the first person talking to them. So it goes back to know your market better than anybody else, right? Get the data as soon as it get recorded. If it means going to the kind of records, go. If it means online, go. Whatever it is, and create a plan to be the first and the last one to be talking to them. Mm. Right. So it's a very persistent game because they're going through an emotional roller coaster. They're about to lose their house. You need to be the person who presents solutions and be there for them, even when they want to curse you. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I've never, I've never said that, but I, I think I'm going to coin that as well. I'll uh, be the first and last person. We do that with probates. Uh, we try to be the first person that they speak to when they file a petition and then also the last. So the constant follow up and making sure that you're touching them. So yeah, I love it. I'm going to add a challenge for you, Brandon. Yeah. Can you be the first one when they pass away and open the probate for them? Right. Yeah. That, that would be even better. That's even better. Yeah. Right. So there, there's ways to get the hold. We, we have a, a state list that we call. So it's a pre probate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can be there because you'll be surprised how many people pass away. They don't open probate for years because mm-hmm. they don't hold. They think, oh, my mom passed away. It's my house. They assume it's their house or a spouse assume it's their house. Right. I've dealt with those. And when you get them and you hold their hand and explain that you have to open probate and you open the probate, you can front that. I absolutely do it. Make sure that you have your attorney review it. If you front it, you pay for it, you control the deal. There's mm-hmm. nothing better than that. Yeah. Not only you're adding significant amount of value for the seller, but you have a peace of mind that you all the way through in the yeah. process. Good stuff. Awesome, man. Well, look, uh, this has been great. And we've talked about, you know, a bunch of different things from, you know, solution based uh, marketing, segmenting, um, you know, how you're sending out your direct mail. You gave us amazing advice uh, on SMS and and how to manage through that. Uh, And then all the gems that you just dropped here recently about focusing um, on, you know, your uh, your your business focusing on your your clients and your data most importantly. Um, well, where can folks learn more about everything that you have going on, uh, as well as you know follow you on social media? Yeah, uh, we'll put my 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 in the show notes. But uh, I'm not super active as a person on social media. Our companies are. Uh, mine is first name last name Jesus Toledo number twenty three on Instagram and Facebook. Our businesses, if you're interested in uh, taking your data to the whole new level, 8020rei.com. If you're interested in taking your CRM to a whole new level, 8020crm.com. I would love to connect with you guys. We have a team there to support you. Good stuff. And as always, folks, head over to send more offers while you're at it. There's nothing there for sale, just a bunch of great information, show notes, uh, and a way to connect with me at sendmoreoffers.com. Can't wait to see you over there. Uh, Jesus, this has been great, man. Uh, I'm going to keep following your journey and uh, hope to work together more, you know, going forward. So this has been great, man. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the time, man. Uh, this was a great interview, man. You're good at this. I didn't realize how good you were by listening to the podcast until I joined you. So yeah, thank you for that. Keep, keep crushing on your podcast. Awesome. I appreciate it, guys. As always, send more offers, do more deals. Until next time. Peace. That's all for this episode of the Send More Offers Real Estate Show with Brandon Barnes. But we know you're craving more knowledge to get yourself ready for that next deal. To schedule a call with Brandon to learn more about how to do deals consistently without seller appointments in a repeatable way, be sure to visit us at sendmoreoffers.com. And be sure to tune in for the next episode of the Send More Offers Real Estate Show.